Welcome back to Live in Italy magazine. I am really pleased to introduce Valeria and Benedetta Bianchini from Local Aromas in Rome. Uh, I'm so excited. I've been watching all of your videos, uh, you know, I've gone through your website, I joined your, your Facebook group, I'm having lots of fun and I can't wait until the end of the year, I'm going to learn how to make gnocchi. <laughs> mm, uh, so we yes. will go into uh, some of all the great things that you do. So let's start um, because first of all, I mean, I know you both speak perfect English. I almost thought you were American the first time I heard you. So I'd like to know, where were you born? Well, we were born, we were born in Rome. Actually, we were born in Rome. Um, our father, he, he used to work for Alitalia. He was a uh, manager of Alitalia. And so when, uh, when I was just three years old, because I just so you know, I'm the oldest one. And <laughs> well, you could tell. <laughs> I thought you were twins. <laughs> <laughs> <My cute. laughs> my dad got transferred to Thailand. And so uh, when then my parents had to put us in kindergarten, then they put us into an English speaking kindergarten. I still remember Mrs. Vipa's kindergarten. And mm -hmm. so that's when we started our, you know, since they knew that was going to be their, their, our life for, you know, a long time, we went to an American school from kinder all the way to 12th grade. Yeah. And so we, we lived six years in Bangkok. Then we moved to Brussels for two years and then Venezuela for five years and Chile for the last five years. So more or less you grew up abroad. Yes. Yes. So what other language well. besides Italian do you speak in English, obviously? Spanish. We're Spanish. fluent in Spanish, too, because we lived 10 years in South America. And, and then, you know, we would, we would come back in to, to Italy every vacation. You know, our mom would even two week vacation, one week vacation. <laughs> she would have us go back to Italy. But but we did grow, um, grow up abroad. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. Very exciting start to life, isn't it? Mm -mm, it yes. is. No, that we we're very blessed about that. So how old were you when you moved back to Italy? And how did that come about? Well, we, we moved right after graduation. I mean, I moved before her. And so I'm, I'm class of 90. So I moved back uh, to, to start university. Mm -hmm. And we moved back to Rome. Yeah. So and, and then I, I came back in 1993 when I graduated from high school. We grew up as, it, as you know, very Italians because of our mom, of the culture that she would continue, um, we would continue living and breathing every day in our family. Yeah. But we had actually never lived for a long time other than like one, two months, a year in Italy. So it was interesting. It was, it was interesting. It wasn't easy to adapt. It took us a few years because... Yes. You know, when you grow up in a very international community, mm -hmm. whatever country you go back to is going to start, is going to feel a little like closed minded, different than where you grew up. You know, we went to an international school and we from the kids from our school were from all over the world. And so it was very diff different compared to growing, going back to living into a city. And um, right. but it was then we fell in love with it. Desperately, we desperately fell in love with Rome once we got adapted to it. Once we got it, once we learned to, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, it, it's complicated, but when you look back at it, I'm sure it's it's just a great life changing experience to 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 have different countries and exposure and culture and all that part of your your you know your real life education. Absolutely. Well, in a way, I mean, yes, absolutely it is. It is. And it's beautiful because, you know, in all these years, especially now during this period of lockdown, we have reunited with all of our friends from graduation. And we're talking that this year they were saying that we graduated 30 years ago. I'm like, what? No, we didn't. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> that was years 30 back. years ago. <laughs> I know. What are you talking feels. about? <laughs> And, um, and it's good because, you know, we haven't seen each other for such a long time. And, um, and, and it's like if we, you know, if we were together yesterday and then, you know, they say all the roads lead to Rome. And so, well, they used to lead to Rome. <laughs> and, um, and so we get to see a lot of, of, of our friends occasionally throughout the, throughout, throughout the years they've come to mm -hmm. visit. So it's good. That's amazing. I love Rome. I was there four years ago. Um, so 
Live in Italy magazine, a couple of the interviews we've done is we're t we've talked to expatriates who have moved to Rome. So in a way, you've been an expatriate who's lived elsewhere. And I wanted to ask, um, what was the thing that you missed the most? I mean, like you can both answer individually because I'm sure it's not the same thing about Italy, about particularly Rome. For me, it was, it was the food. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, our mom is an amazing, uh, an amazing cook. She's an amazing home chef. So she would cook a lot and all traditional and she got, she learned all the local dishes of the countries. But for me, there are some things that I remember that when we would come back to Italy, we would beg our grandmother as a first meal just to have, I think probably this would, would, would have been Benny's same answer. Same. We would beg her to have prosciutto crudo, so raw ham with mozzarella yeah. and an Italian, a, a Roman bread called rosetta, which is like a rose shaped bread. And right. that was like every time we would come to Italy, our very, very first meal, no matter what time of the day the plane would land, we wanted to have prosciutto, mozzarella and rosetta for the meal. That was, that was like the one thing because you can't Man, get these lovely. things. Or maybe now you can, but back then, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, right. um, it was more difficult to find, you know, to, to export certain types of foods. And so we wouldn't have them in, in the countries where we lived. Yes, totally understandable. And I will say too, that even if we can get them here, it's not of the same quality and standard that you can get in Italy. <laughs> exactly. And Benedetta, I think, do, are the well, same or what did same. you miss the most? No, the same. Oh, yeah, the food. You know, prosciutto and mozzarella, we could not, <laughs> you know, after six years in Thailand or, or even in Caracas, you could not find the prosciutto that you could find here. And then the, day, the next day or immediately after, the supplì. We would go to this place and we would get the supri and that too was just like <gasps> a supri wow. is is a very roman um fast food it's a fast food yeah. sort of dish it's a fried rice ball right with the heart of mozzarella inside so those those were our things and i i will i'll tell our readers and our watchers that you have a video on the supri so it's a very nice introduction. Um, I'd like to ask though, uh, what, this is, you know, Arancini in Sicilia, okay? Is that the same or not? No. No, it's not the same. I mean, they're both made with rice. This could be the only thing that they have similar in that, and they're fried, but they're completely different from the shape to, to, to the, to the right. side, yeah. No. The way it's prepared. Uh, this is something I did not experience in Rome. And, and after seeing that, I was like, okay, next time. That, <laughs> that, is, that, is, street food. that is why we did the, we decided to launch our YouTube channel a year and a half ago because the first, our first thought was, you know, we have, we do all these in-person experiences, but it's a shame not to share all our stories with a broader audience. And mm -hmm. then also because a lot of the people that were like doing, that were doing experiences with us uh, during our cooking classes, they would like leave the following day. And so we would start asking like, did you eat this? And did you eat this? And they're like, no, I didn't know about it. And so yeah. that is why we did, we decided to do our um, YouTube channel. At the beginning, it wasn't about recipes or like first, our first episodes was the two of us going around Rome and picking the, the best foods and the best dishes that you had to have. And soupli was one of those because a lot of people have never heard of it. And you, you eat soupli in Rome only and in no other part. I mean, you go out of Rome and you don't have soupli anymore. Well, I definitely need to try it in the end. <laughs> and it looks know. delicious. Yes, now I know, thanks to you. So that comes to it, like about local aromas. Um, you've already talked about where you've lived abroad, but how did it come about? And about well, when? We've, 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 been, we've been together, as my sister said, together, you know, if we accumulate all our years that we've been working in hospitality, we've been in hospitality mm -hmm. about 30 years. And my sister, she's a trained pastry chef. And we each followed our passion. She's got more of a sweet tooth, so she's a trained pastry chef. I became a wine sommelier, a professional cheese taster, and an olive oil sommelier. Our mom is a wonderful chef. And after being so much in tourism, I don't know, we just realized that there was so much more that we had to say. Because, you know, food for us, Italians, mm -hmm. 
it's it's in our blood like we really it's it's part of of you know so we wanted to share a concept of Italian food as you know we we always tell people that there's no such thing as Italian food and so we wanted to proof it because we've had people come here and ask us where can you have the best pesto in Rome you don't have pesto in Rome you know you have carbonara you have you, and so with right. that philosophy in mind we just thought we were ready to to just share our passion and share this mission because it's more it's, it's a mission and and so that's why we we decided to launch local and Rome. also what i mean what we do okay we do food tours wine tastings what local aromas really does you know we do food tours we do wine tastings cooking classes but what we really really do is share the italian culture through food and wine we want right. people to really understand what our culture is why you have these ingredients Mm -hmm. why these ingredients have been put together in this dish why do you have these dishes in rome only or like you know you go to venice people are like oh the pizza in venice you don't eat pizza when you go to venice you know there are only two places in italy where you would really want to have pizza which is rome and naples it's not that you can't have pizza in other parts of rome you obviously can eat whatever you want you can have pesto in sicily though it's from the northern part it's just I mean, when you when you get to learn about a country, food, at least in Italy, is a very, very strong part of it. So if you want to learn the culture, when you come to Italy, you have to incorporate the food experience in it. Mm -hmm. And and that is, you know, that is why we called our company Local Aromas. You know, when you come to Rome, you have to experience these dishes. When my daughter, you know, now she she I, I have trained her a little bit better. It took me several <laughs> years. <laughs> But, you know, when she went to Florence and she's like, okay, I'm going to have a lasagna. I'm like, I, you can't have a lasagna when you're in Florence because it's not part of the culture. There's so many different things to taste. And, and so, I mean, I've done that to my kids and we want to do that with the people who, who, who come across Italy. And I think that's very important because a lot of people go back to Italy, you know, quite a few times in different places. So they want to be able to um, learn about regional food, not just, uh, you know, to get away from the stereotypes. And I want to go back to Benedetta uh, for a moment because she was saying that there's no such thing as Italian food and that's on your website and you've explained that a bit. So just explain that a bit about why do you say that? Because here, you know, in North America, we're going to say, let's go out for Italian food, or I feel like Italian food, but you're telling us there's no such thing as Italian food. No, there is no such thing, because if you think about Italy, I mean, we are a patchwork of regions mm -hmm. that have such a strong identity that got put together as a country not that long ago, but each, each region has its own, you know, culinary traditions, wine, foods, desserts. I mean, they have, they're like all little countries by themselves, the only and, and and there's cultural differences too like even just the language if you you know you take somebody from venice and, and you take somebody from sicily and you put them together you don't understand what they're saying it's just the dialects i mean they're all different and and this reflects in, in the food so much and um and, and that's the beauty of it that's the magic of it because um there's it's just so different from wine to oil to to everything to the flavors to to the concept of, of, you know, of food. It's always and, an important concept. And, <laughs> yes. and, you know, it's not only from one region to another, it's also within the same region. You know, yeah. for instance, like there's a very traditional street food dish in Florence called Lampredotto. And you eat this in Florence, that's it. You go to Siena, you go to other places, they don't serve it. So, um, and so it's like every time you move from one town to the other, it's like visiting a different culture. And that, I mean, so Rome is, Italy is full of cultures. I mean, yes. Italians don't even know them. I mean, oh, I, no. I have no yeah. idea what you have in certain towns of, or areas of Italy, unless I have personally, you know, visited it and informed myself right. because you don't know. Yeah, that's very interesting. And certainly something that uh, I think it will um, open up a lot of people's eyes as far as education, as far as food. Like I said, kind of getting away from the stereotype and starting to explore. I mean, like you said, it's like trips to different regions, different cultures uh, within just the one country that, as we now know it. 
Um, so let's talk about Rome. Rome. Rome is a huge city. So would you say Rome in itself, as far as food, is its own region? Or would you say Rome as part of Lazio is, has its, is its own region? No, Rome is, oh. is, is a city See. with mm -hmm. very specific culture. With, so, you know, which you don't find in other towns around Rome, around Rome, right. yeah, I would say it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's different. Yeah. I mean, you, you find, you know, you, you have, you, you know, Lazio, but there's, you know, some certain foods that you just, you know, that little towns are famous for, for, for that specific food, which you would have to, you know, go there because it's something typical of that place, mm -hmm. which sometimes it's even not only of that place, but in a certain moment of the year, like, I don't know, um, there's, it's, it's like certain festivities in certain towns, they create dishes that have been done for years and years and years, but it's just in that little, in that certain town. And that's also fascinating because when you meet people and they talk about it and you have no idea what they're talking about and they look at you as, you know, as if everybody should take for granted that that's a, a particular food. And uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, complicated and it worth learning. Re, you know, over repeated experiences, I think. So I don't want to get into it too much, but it's just that the other day I was watching your pizza video and be, having been in Rome quite recently, um, I do kind of know the difference between uh, pizza in Rome and pizza in Naples. But can you explain that to us? You're, you're obviously more educated about this than me. Well, the, I mean, the way the pizza is made is different. So in Rome, our pizza is has a thin crust mm -hmm. and you, you prepare the dough and then you, uh, you roll it out with a rolling pin. You get it really thin. In Naples, the, the, the way it's done, because making pizza is extreme, it's, it's a science, it's very, it's very difficult. And mm -hmm. they never, uh, they, they never need it. You sort of like do this, like you move your hands, you massage it so that you don't break all the air bubbles in it. And though it is thinner in the center, it has a fluffy and, and thicker crust. And it, it is completely different and you would never, ask a Roman or, you know, Romans will always say that they prefer Roman pizza. It's because it's a very strong part of, of our, each of our local cultures. And another thing that Rome has that Naples though doesn't have is that we have many different other types of pizzas, which is a pizza by the slice. Um, right. Like for instance, you would have a pizza like for lunchtime and we have these many, many different kinds of pizzas that you have like on the tray that you cut in pieces or the pizza a la pala. How would you say that, Benny? Well, it's, it's like a, a long oval pizza that you just, uh, a la pala because, a la pala because it's, like, it's put like with a cricket board directly yes. inside the oven. Yeah, and for anyone who wants to know, they can watch that video and see that. And it was also interesting to see how they cut it even. It's on these racks. Um, and yeah, then you go, I, you want like yeah. this, like this, yeah. like this, like <laughs> Which is great because you can try a whole bunch, <laughs> you know, of different kinds. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, Benedetta, I, I found it very interesting to find out. Well, first of all, we do talk about wine and we do have a wine editor. Uh, he's actually uh, with the certified Italian wine ambassador. Um, and he writes about it, but then I, I, so I, I've come to know, uh, you know, not quite a bit, because obviously with there being 590 indigenous grapes, <laughs> I can't say I know anything close, but I'm curious, um, being an olive sommelier in Italy, what does that mean? Uh, so I've been around olive oil for many, many years, but as, as a complete ignorant olive oil consumer, because yeah, I, I lived in Umbria for 15 years, you know, Umbria, mm -hmm. you know, the green heart of Italy, you know, surrounded by olive. So I've always had good olive oils, but I never considered olive oil to be, you know, you just think it of as, as a condiment, you know, you just think that all olive oils are made. It's just olive oils, but there are so many different types of olives and like wine, like the grape by itself, each olive has a particular characteristic. So my becoming an olive oil sommelier was thanks to a chocolate cake. Because I, um, you know, when, when you, 
when you become a foodie and you get specific, you hang around with people at the end who, who have your same passions. And so we become a little bit obsessive. And so I have this, these really good friends of mine. He's a master uh, wine sommelier and she is a certified olive oil taster and a wonderful cook. So we, I had dinner there and she bought this chocolate cake, very plain, like sponge cake. And then she said, wait, don't eat it. And she drizzled this olive oil from Sicily on the, this chocolate cake. And it was just like, it was just like mind blowing. Look, I still get goosebumps when I think about it. And I'm like, what the hell just happened here? It was like yeah. an orchestra opening up in your mouth. And you're like, and so then I decided to look into it. And it's just fascinating because just like food, just like wine, each region has olives that grow just in that specific region. And just like grapes, each olive has a completely different aromatic profile. And now yes. more and more chefs are studying the pairing of all with the olive, the olive oil with the food, because like wine, it could completely change the food that you're eating. And it's just, it's just fascinating. It's no, that's such true. A world. And, and that is what makes the regional cuisine so different from one other. It's the ingredients that, you know, the base of all the history of the, the culinary history of the dishes is actually the ingredients that they have had and that they, you know, available around them. So if right. you go in the, in the very northern part of Italy, which are closer to the Alps, mm -hmm. which, you know, that are higher, that, I mean, at, at, in the mountains, they will obviously not have olives growing. So, yes. you know, their kitchen will be more buttery. And, yeah. and that is why... That is probably why the, the main reason is why there is no such thing as Italian food because yes. you know the climate in Sicily is so very different to the climate of the very very north of Italy close to Austria you know so you yes. can't have the same dishes and the same culture. That makes so much sense and and thank you for elaborating on that as well. I, I find that fascinating. I'm going to do some reading. Um, I just finished uh, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, the second level, and, and that's yeah. what I wanted to know about olives, you know, is it the terroir, is it, is it you know, everything, yeah, <laughs> the I climate. Mean, it's everything. I mean, the, it's the, the the terroir is not going to influence as much as it does in wine because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, let's, I mean let's not get specific like the wine roots go very deep the olives they they tend to, to go more horizontal but but uh, but you will see and especially if you've done your, your wine training and so you've been training your nose mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna capture the different aromas from from the olive oil like immediately and you're just gonna see how different they can be I mean you could get from you know from from tomatoes to cut grass to um, a rucola to just artichokes and uh, the intensities and it's it's fascinating. fascinating yeah certainly something that we won't really be able to experience i think as far as the pairing unless we go into italy and to the yes. regions so mm -hmm. definitely people who are visiting and are fascinated by food like you said um they, they should look into that yes yeah just keep just you know just pay start paying attention to that detail because when you start paying attention then, you know, that's, you know, because until somebody doesn't tell you, you don't pay attention, you know, but then when you do, yeah. you're like, ooh, you know, and uh, yeah, no, absolutely do, because it's wonderful. So then we'll just um, quickly get into your other area expertise. I don't know if it's quickly, because I'm sure it's just as complicated cheese. You're a cheese expert. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't know either. <laughs> so you have to tell me or tell us what's a cheese expert. <laughs> well, you know, cheese is to make the. I mean, cheese is 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 as complicated to make. Is maybe even more complicated to make than than wine because you know cheese. You have you have the milk and and you know here in Italy we're allowed unlike in the states to make cheeses with with raw milk that you can eat fresh. In the states you mm -hmm. have to eat at least sixty days, and the world of cheese is just it's just art because it's, it's, you know, it's milk that, you know, you, you turn it into, you know, the, you, when you divide it, it turns from the way to the curd. And then the way they, this curd is treated is like having a newborn. And there is this, this, this uh, profession that is vanishing now. And it's, I don't know how you translate it into English. It's a finatore. It's a person that buys just the shape of the fresh cheese and then dresses, dresses it up or like in vine leaves, or they put it in, in caves where then the bacteria naturally, it's just, it's magic. And cheese wow. keeps changing. Like the flavors of the cheese, as they age, they change. It's, it's, it's an evolving, completely different world of, of Yeah, flavors. and also when, when the cheese is prepared 
by like hand when they're when they're handmade rather than industrially yeah and yeah. raw milk cheese is used you mm -hmm. really do or at least i i can't tell the difference but ben you can uh, <laughs> but like what the cow has been eating on you know if it was a cow that 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 um did the milk during sp spring or during other sp during the summer because you can that goes through the milk because you are actually having the purest kind of aromas they're, they're like saved into the milk rather than industrially where they're just everything is boiled you, they you can't you right. can't sense any of the flavors and the aromas and they just make cheese and if necessary they add different flavors to get whatever they want so it, it is an art no it is an art it's fascinating and you know and and and, and and you know, it had, there's so much care behind the cheese, and you have to turn it every day. You just have to—it's like having a newborn, which you have to attend. You know, I mean, you know, if it's, you know, some cheeses before they can go out on the market that are aged, they don't go out before one year. You know, that's a year of taking care. It's just—it's—it's it's fascinating that they still do these things, and it's just that too. Like, okay, they cost more. It's like if you buy a good bottle of wine because that, of course. The, 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 the amount of work put behind each of these cheeses is just incredible. And I think that's very important, like you were saying, in comparison to wine. The more you get to know about these things, the more you value why there's co uh, like a, a cost behind it and you can appreciate it. It's not just I'm paying for it. It's trendy, let's say, or something like that, or it, it, there's a reason. It, and, and, and we also need to maybe invest in those kind of things because it's preserving so much of the culture and tradition that could easily be lost uh, through exactly. industrialization. Exactly. So when we're talking about certifications, Valeria, you're a trained pastry chef. Yes, yes. I've always loved pastry. And, and so I said, you know, I just really want to understand it because I've always been fascinated by the chemistry mm -hmm. and, and the ingredients. And, and so, you know, pastry is, is pure science, is pure chemistry. And, and, and going to pastry school, you know, we learned, we learned everything from the simple homemade recipes and pastries to the very fancy restaurant, you know, modern, different kind of pastries. And it was, it was, it was like very, very interesting. I mean, I, I've just, you learn about so many things so that then you understand what you need to do if something happens. You are a lot more critical when you are preparing a, a recipe right right and and i believe um you have i i i looked over a video um that you've discussed flour and the importance of flour in italian culture um so do you think that being trained as a pastry chef in italy is maybe a lot different than other places because there's just so many different variations there are many different variations and which and the flour itself in pastry you you can use many different not only wheat but a lot of pastries are you you can use oats you can use different kinds usually in pastry what is mainly used is in italy we would use the double zero flour which is very right. probably in the u.s it would be considered cake flour just mm -hmm. the very like like bleached white flour because it does matter it does matter on on the consistency of you know of the gluten and and how much the the cake it has to hold the bubbles or not i mean some pastries also would would include like christmas desserts in italy the famous panettone there you would use completely different flours so right. it's, it takes a lot to really it's not easy. I mean, when you have a pastry recipe, like a dessert recipe, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, I understood a lot because I was wondering, like, why do so many pastry chefs? Once I asked one of my one of my teachers, why do you share your pastry recipes with other people? And they're like, because they will never. I mean, I'm okay with it. I mean, they will never get my same result because when you do right. pastry, the experience is, I would say. 40% of the recipe because sometimes it's just like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? I mean, how, how whipped does the cream have to be? So it doesn't yes. have to be sort of, and, and those little details during the process makes a whole difference in the final result. I, I, I don't know a, a lot about it, but I do love to bake. And no, I would neither say, it's my like, sister. <laughs> no, I don't. That's yeah. why I don't bake. 
That's why I'm when it, in wine <laughs> and oil. <laughs> No, I don't it is have to- very important because like, um, you know, it's like you said, that, that everybody is going to do it differently. It's almost like it fingerprints. Nothing ever duplicates again, even with the same person, I imagine, preparing it. So I, I noticed that in your videos, you're often um, referring to cookbooks and, and different sources of inspiration. Uh, do you both have um, a mentor, somebody who's helped you, you know, uh, my sister more in the field yeah, yeah. she has in pastry okay do you want to name a couple or <laughs> and then we can go google them after <laughs> vale no Valeria? i don't I do yeah i do have a okay can you see me now yes. yes okay i apologize i don't know what's wrong with my i mean i'm home alone so i don't know um anyway i have a i have a mentor for my pastry and he was one of my teachers in, in our pastry school and he's called Maurizio Santin. He comes from, from a, a, a family of chefs and he is just amazing. And what I like the most about him is that he shares doable recipes at home because you know, mm -hmm. when you get into seeing these beautiful pastries, there are so many ingredients and so many steps that it makes it impossible for a regular housewife or just anybody who just likes to make who just wants to make a cake it, yes. you can't do it you can't do it right. because some ingredients you you don't even know where to look for and so something that i really appreciated so he created even though he, he created a manual that for me is like my pastry bible and but still all the recipes and all the ingredients are anybody could find and and so that is something that i really really appreciate the most about him and all of his recipes turn out just yeah. like perfect. I mean, my I, sister. Yeah, I, exactly. They out with me. So if they turned out with me, yes, no. Anybody can. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's good to know. know. <laughs> yes. Uh, she I'll doesn't have patience. Me. My sister oh, doesn't have patience with, with pastry. Cause no. I, I tease her a lot. Cause I tell her, you know, during the videos, I'm like, okay, Benny, can you please, I need 75 grams of eggs. And she's like, what? <laughs> and 12 grams of this and you know, five grams of salt. She doesn't understand, she doesn't understand this, well, but I'm that's why I pinch Yes, and if, if, if one thing that I've learned from you, Valeria, is if, if anyone wants to even try to start to get into this, get yourself um, a, a scale. A scale, <laughs> <doing> yes. <laughs> yes. And because, even weigh those egg yolks. <laughs> exactly. No, because, you know, I, when I do the reverse thing, you know, I get an American recipe with cups and, and teaspoons. I have to weigh the, the cup at least two or three times, and then I get an average out of it because it will never weigh the same. Yes. It is very, like you said, it is a science, and I have a lot of respect for what you do. Yes, it's not like cooking. You can't improvise. Mm -mm. Um, so let's talk about that because obviously you're you're dealing in, you know with the the tourism industry and tourists and people looking for local aromas as authentic things what kind of advice could you give to people because obviously when you go to a place like rome and if it's for the first time especially you want to go to those most popular sites and you tend to i'm hungry i'm just going to go to the closest place but the thing is with pastries or something like this we want the real deal. So what kind of advice would you give people to say, where do you go look and how do you know? Well, I mean, the Roman pastries are very simple. It's things that probably you would make at home as well. You know, we have um, like like for, for breakfast, because those that's still part of pastry, you know, Roman, Italian breakfast, Roman breakfast is sweet. So you would have your mm -hmm. cappuccino and, you would have your your cornetto, your croissant, if yes. you're starting from breakfast. And I'm I'm a little picky on that. <laughs> My sister hates to have breakfast with no, me. No, it's embarrassing. Because I just look at um, just how the place is, how the, the the pastry is served. Because not all the like, if you're having breakfast, for instance, not all the the cafes produce their own pastry. Right. And so if I see that they come in like these boxes or you, you have to you have to pay attention to the place itself some mm -hmm. some places are very like some some pastries or some we have this thing like bakeries yeah we have forno 
They're called forno. They're like bakeries where they make right. bread and then they make not very sophisticated cakes. Mm -hmm. And um, so like going into a forno is, is a good place. You get ciambellone, you get very simple, nothing Gata. fancy. Yes, yes. Or like an, another Roman dish, which uh, another Roman pastry, which you don't find, you mainly find in the Jewish ghetto oh, is nice. this, this tart called crostata. And it's, and it's like sort of like a pie. And it has um, ricotta cheese and and sour and sour cherry jam, and wow, that is very delicious. oh, it's delicious. And that's a <laughs> Roman Jewish pastry. And you wow. forgot the ciambellone fritto. La, la ciambella fritta la ciambella for fritta. breakfast. Oh gosh, yes, this <laughs> is another. It's sort of like a donut. Okay. And but we don't we don't use in Italy. We don't use all these um, like icings and things like that unless you're doing like modern cakes uh it's just this fried dough donut like with a little hole you fried and then they put sugar on both sides and that's another breakfast thing we did a video about it because it's it's, it's just, just delicious so i look for that mm -hmm. it does sound delicious i'm getting hungry it's still morning <laughs> Yeah, it's still morning. I can even still have a cappuccino because it's not 11.30. Brava. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, uh, I, I noticed, I, I think it's a fairly new thing. You're now offering um, cooking classes online. Yeah, we, we created an online cooking school. Mm -hmm. And this is a project that we've had in the back of our minds for a long time because we wanted to continue having that conversation with people that we are not directly with. And we wanted to give them a lot, a lot, a lot of information that we can't do when we are in person. Right. And so it's an on-demand course. So we have a cooking school and we add more than courses, they are complete guides. We've added the complete guide to fresh homemade pasta to mm -hmm. gnocchi, we've just added Italian wines. So um, not only do we give the recipe, but we also continue that conversation of the storytelling. So why culturally do we have this? Or the scientific part that I like, why do you need, why is the flour important here? You know, when you're making gnocchi, it doesn't matter what exactly what type of flour, it's not gonna make a difference. But right. when you're making pasta, fresh homemade pasta, it will. So we explain the differences because you know, in each, in each country you have different blends. And the good thing of having um, over 30 combined years of experience and with hospitality and everything is that we know what non-Italians ask us. And so we have answered everything that we have been asked in all these years. Things that for Italians are just common sense but it is not for, for somebody who is not Italian because they don't know. So, um, you know, questions about how do you cook pasta? Do you rinse the pasta before? Do you rinse the pasta after? Or how do you store it? What, what yes. sauces? And so uh, we, through the school, we have, we're putting together everything we know and beyond because we do a lot of research for each course using textbooks and cookbooks that have never been translated into any language. I mean, they're just, they're just available in Italian. So right. we wanted to add value because we are sharing something that nobody would have access to otherwise. Yeah, that, that's definitely interesting. I had a look at like the curriculum kind of guide for each course, it, you know, you explain it really well. And, and like I said, just, just knowing those things that might not be easily accessible I think is a great opportunity for anybody who wants to, you know, get better at, at their, at their skills. Um, and then so put it all in one place, which is also important, you know, right. because you're looking for something, it, you just, you know, you want to know about the flowers and then you want to know about how to, how to store it. And then you want to know how to, how to create that. Mm -hmm. I always take, for example, orecchiette, which was, you know, orecchiette is, is difficult to make. And, and, and yes. as a, we're going to, our father doesn't know, but as the lowest common denominator, we took our father, who barely knows mm -hmm. how to cook an egg, 
Like, would mm -hmm. dad be able to do this watching our video? And, and yes. Okay. So it's, it's for everybody. It's not pretentious. So people think that making pasta, making gnocchi is like, oh my gosh, it's so complicated. No, it's not. You have to know how to do it, how to feel, how, you know, how to let it rest, how, what it should feel like. So it's just the basics all in one place. And everything is linkable. And we just wanted to make it as simple and 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 just as and easy. friendly and, and friendly, friendly because what I was looking for thank you you're welcome and we're making yeah because we, we're talking to somebody the person we're talking to in our courses is somebody that doesn't know anything anything about Italy or anything about the ingredients so we start from the very very beginning but right. the content is even for professionals because, mm -hmm. for instance, for the pasta course, we go into detail into the pasta shapes. Now we have over 20 different pasta shapes in the course. There are over 300 in Italy, so it's going to be a work in process. Um, and also the gnocchi, we're going to be adding because there's so much. The wines, you know, we, we have about 20 different Ooh. wines, but they are, as you said, over 500 different grapes. So there's a lot right. to talk about. A yeah. lot. Okay. That's amazing. And so much, I mean, you do also offer the in-person cooking classes, but here's an opportunity, even if you take the in-person to expand upon it even more when you go home. Um, for a lot of us, we're not traveling right now or can't travel. So here's a, a great opportunity to, to learn something in depth, yeah. you know, a follow-up to a visit. And on your own schedule and at yes. your own pace. That's why yes. We, we do live, we do online live um, classes, private classes, but this is something, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, to put everybody's schedule and uh, jet lag at the same. And so this is something, yeah. <laughs> the reason why we decided to invest so much energy into our online cooking school is because you can advance and you have it available at you for you 24 7 and if you have a question at the end of each lesson there is a comments section that then we personally answer to so it's like oh. having a chef with you all the time yeah that's fantastic that's that's a real benefit so it's not just play figure it out yourself and and that's it oh that's really wow oh yeah we wow, get that's a huge endeavor phone, and then we answer <laughs> yeah <laughs> There you go. There you go. Twenty four seven, almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's good to know. That that's really great. I love that idea. That's a great concept. Uh, how fantastic! So I wanted to talk about because I, I am a foodie. I do love to cook. I do love to bake. You know, and whenever I mean, I need to get away from kind of work uh, into the kitchen. I go and doing some you know preliminary learning about. Um, regional Italian food, I noticed um, there seems to me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, kind of a common denominator that a lot of the food traditions have been um, rooted in the philosophy that nothing goes to waste, that we use everything. Do you want to comment, either of you or both of you on that? Well, we, yeah, we, we don't, we don't, we try not to put anything to waste. There is, there is um, just, even just the animal, like for example, pork. Pork, mm -hmm. there you eat that you eat every single part of the pork. You, you turn it into ham, you have the the the, the cotica, which is you know cotica con fagioli, it's another, it's another dish, it's it's the heart. We don't throw anything away, right? Or even supli, even the you wine. Know, supli that we're talking about. Right. Exactly. You know, it's 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 to save leftover rice. Right. Gnocchi. There's some gnocchi made with um, just stale bread and you moisten it's it out. Gnocchi. There's some gnocchi oh. made with Oh, grappa also. Grappa is made with the, with the leftover uh, crushed grapes from the wine production. Yes. You know, and I, um, it, it, we just had a contributor to our, our, our website who a contributed a recipe in Italian for sugo di uva fragola. Si. So it's using the leftover bad grapes that you'd normally go throw out. And a lot of us wouldn't think about that. We just think, you know, grapes, it's harvest, goes to wine and whatever's bad, you know, goes somewhere else. But this is actually a pudding. And it, it, the, the history of it was so interesting. That's why I kind of picked up on it because um, the idea was it originally was like a, the poor people's dessert. Um, but it's become, you know, kind of a very traditional recipe in certain regions too. So that's fascinating. 
And I think that's a big lesson for, I, I've noticed that when I've talked to people who come into the United States, that they notice when they come from Europe and they spend some time here is how much we waste. And I think it's very important now to kind of revive some of those things so we can learn as well that, you know, there's a delicious way to, to, to use everything. As Valera was saying, when, when we were putting together the gnocchi course, you know, you think gnocchi, gnocchi potato, gnocchi with ricotta, but the, the gnocchi is made with leftover bread. Mm. They were just amazing. Never... Not only that leftover bread, but leftover polenta, especially obviously there's from up north. So you have leftover polenta, what do you do? You turn it into gnocchi. And, um, and it was just fascinating because, you know, you would never think of it. And, um, no. but, but even and this is something that our mom does. I mean, we grew up with, with, and this is some, a culture of something that, you know, you, you also do in families. So our mom, um, she can create these amazing dishes with whatever she opens and has in the fridge because it's, you, you can't throw away food. You know, so if you have leftover chicken and leftover this, then, she, then she'll make these amazing chicken meatballs. You know, they're obviously you don't have to, this, it's, I mean, some traditional dishes are a recreation of, you know, past or, or like pieces of the animal that would have been thrown away, just like tripe. You know, right. so many countries just throw things away and the interior of, of the animal and we have turned it into a dish. If not, you know, at home you, you put together all the ingredients and you create a, a dish just so you don't throw things away. That's amazing. And so many dishes have, were born on that concept. Mm -mm. You know, like, so yeah, so the leftover, that's a big, big Because thing. Italian cuisine in general, the thing that they may probably have in common is that it's a, it's a peasant cuisine. Yes. It's not very sophisticated. You've talked about, you know, obviously you specialize in Rome, but is there a place that you just absolutely love in Italy, the place where you go get away, um, you know, so you could recommend, you know, when people are traveling? Gosh, that's a very difficult question. I, I have I my figured. answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, there, each region in Italy gives something very different of its own. Yes. But what I love, there's this region that fascinates me the most, which is Sicily. And mm. it's probably not one of the places that you go first when you come to Italy for the first time. But it is fascinating because it is... It, it is so genuine. Some towns have like frozen, they're like a hundred years back compared to Rome. And it's so simple and the food is just, is just amazing. And it's so different though it's, though it's just an island. It is so different. And a lot of the ingredients that we use in Italy have the name of towns that are from Sicily because like the cherry tomatoes that we that we use in Italy are called pacchino which come mm -hmm. from the town of pacchino in Sicily or like the pistachio the most famous italian pistachio is pistacchio di bronte and bronte is a town in sicily <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for finishing that until Valeria comes back. Yeah. So what um, about you, Benedetta? Do you, can you well, think um, of a cherished place? Well, I, two, year, two years ago, for the first time, I went to, to the island of Sardinia because mm. I, I had, uh, you know, I decided with my daughter, okay, let's go to the beach. And I'm like, okay, the island of Sardinia. They always say magical things about it. And you see these pictures and then you know, we lived, we lived in, in, in Venezuela for eight years. I mean, you know, we, we, had, we did hang around the Caribbean. And I was just, I mean, the island of Sardinia, well, I, you know, it's a big, big island, but it is yeah. just beautiful. I mean, the beaches are breathtaking. The food is incredible. And there too, it's very wild. It's very, it's very rustic. And you still, it's, sometimes it's like living in another era, in another century. Exactly. And with genuine food. And there too, they have their... Their, their language because you know when you have somebody speak Sardo straight you don't understand a word that they're saying and um, they have incredible wines and the food that and uh, it's just um it's superb imagine mm -hmm. that pecorino romano the roman pecorino right only with with uh milk from sheep that are bred or in the region of lazio or in the island of sardinia that's oh, it. interesting mm -hmm. wow yeah. that's a great fact i love that um, definitely, I'll look more into that that uh, area. 
And so people don't, I mean, Italians go to Sardinia because, you know, it's a wonderful place to go to the beach at because it's really beautiful. But it's not, I mean, you know, a lot of, it's still not very known, fortunately, to, um, but then everywhere you go, you know, you go up to the Dolomites and it's just like, oh, beautiful. Oh. I mean, yeah. Italy is so, yes. so different. It's just magical. Or, the, or Puglia in the hill of, mm -hmm. of Italy. Every Italian region is, is, is fascinating and it just gives you something. But if I had to pick one, I would pick Sicily. I've never been to Sicily. I know, I know. I've I'm been, sure I've that been if there. I go, I'm probably going to stay there. But yeah, yeah Sicily is wonderful. It's wonderful. That's good to know. So, and it, it's good to know also to to hear from Italians uh, that they're within their own country. There's just you know so many places still yet to be explored. Oh yes, and discovered. Yeah. I haven't been to all twenty regions of Italy. I haven't visited them all. No, nor have I. Hmm. Yeah. So we still have a lot of exploring to do. Yes. yes and, uh, That's fun. So exciting. <laughs> and so much more eating to do. Yeah, more, more food <laughs> research. More food. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Oh, I, I could go for that. So um, <laughs> let's get into local aromas. Uh, tell us some of the offerings that you have, uh, some of the benefits. I think you have like a subscriber program. Just get into everything that you offer. So our... Vale, go. No, go ahead, Benny. Go, go, please, please, go. <laughs> now, we, well, Local Aromas, we do in-person experiences, obviously now a little less than before, yeah. where we do cooking classes, wine tastings, food tours, and now all of our energy we are, um, we're, we're putting in our online cooking school called Italian Home Cooking Made Simple. And you can subscribe to the entire school on a monthly basis and get access to all the current and new content we will be adding. Or you can choose what one course you like the most, or if you're just interested in wine or you're just interested in pasta, and you can get a one-year subscription and have that available for you for 365 days. That's amazing. Plus the one-on-one, -on -one, if, if anyone has any questions. Exactly. Yeah. We also have a one-on-one -on -one coaching um, with the two of us, just in case people want to go a little bit more in depth or want to have a conversation about something with us. And we're going to also be adding the one-on-one -on -one with our wine sommeliers, which is Benedetta and another wine sommelier, Eric. Mm -hmm. And so that is another opportunity, just in case people want to have a conversation with two local Italian sommeliers. So are you going into pairing then um, as well uh, with some well, of these dishes? It could be a conversation, you know, it could be a conversation. If, if that's something that somebody wants to do, uh, why not? Yes. Yeah, of course. And it might come naturally anyway. Exactly. If, if, that's, because the one-on-one so, -on -one coaching is... Is, com is, is private and is completely customizable. You know, whatever the person asks us to, to talk about or to discuss about and to learn about, mm -hmm. that is what we will be doing. That's fantastic. It's great to know. I, I'm really excited about that. Like I said, I'm going to go ahead and start with gnocchi and, and take it from there. <laughs> and <laughs> you're promising me it's not as hard as I think it is. It's so. hard. And it's, you're going to, look, look, I will give you my tip on making perfect gnocchi. Okay. Good music, glass of <laughs> wine, and you know, you just, it's, just, it's just a moment of mindfulness. You know, you just roll and roll and roll and, and the first time it's gonna come and then it's just gonna come. It's just, it's just a moment of, of you just mindfulness, you know? Good music, a glass of wine, you just sit there and you roll your gnocchi out and they'll turn out perfect. Yes. That's true. That's, that's great advice and that's key. And that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, me and many of us uh, find ourselves in the kitchen is just to, to get lost in it um, and get away. So that, that's great advice. So go ahead. Um, I don't know if it's Valeria, Benedetta, uh, tell us how to find you in every respect, because I know there's different ways we can even get a hold of your mom. <laughs> Well, the first place where you should go is to the Local Aromas YouTube channel, because there we have Local we Aromas YouTube channel, yeah, yeah, exactly. There we have all our videos, and then from there, you have the link to our Facebook, to, to our Instagram. We're very active on the Instagram. I picked up from where you froze. Well, the yes. first place where you should go is to the Local Aromas YouTube channel. 
Right. That we've got, you, first of all, you have our mom. <laughs> and then we have over, we have over uh, 100 videos, recipes, what to eat in Rome, what to do, how to pick your gelato. That's the one place you should go. Well, we really value all of your expert tips that you've given us today. Okay, so we know how to find you on YouTube. Tell us your website and your social media handles. So our website is uh, localaromas.com mm -hmm. and uh, we are very strong on, on Instagram, local aromas, Facebook, local aromas, you know, it's, it's local aromas. We also have, which is just about the two of us, the foodie, it's called Foodie Sisters in Italy on Instagram and on right. Facebook. And I think that's how I originally discovered you. So that's great. And I love watching, uh, it's a little bit more personal, um, things that inspire you, your day. So it's really nice. It's really nice to have gotten to get to know you that way. And now you can get on in, in person uh, to resume. You. So uh, we are um, Live in Italy magazine and the, the website is www.liveinitalymag.com and the handles are the same as well. So um, I hope to see you next time in Rome. I'm going to really take that cooking oh, class yes. next time. Oh, I miss that opportunity. So much, Lisa. Get ready. I want to be spoiled and you're I want to get the best, best, the best coffee, the best pizza. <laughs> And you will, you will, because we'll take you to this, to our little favorite places. Please, yes, yeah. definitely.